discuss that. And yes. I think that... okay. okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for clearing your Saturday afternoon on this very important topic that is not necessarily discussed all the time. That is about voter registration. And more importantly is what you should know about. Okay. In the midst of, uh, among our guests here, we have people who represent political parties, NGOs. Some of you are assistant registration officers, fellow Tinda Malaysia volunteers and friends of ours. When you register yourself as a voter, how sure are you that your name is going to be in the electoral roll? Hence, ensuring your right to be a voter in the coming elections. Or the other scenario, you just updated your address. Have you confirmed that it, you can vote in a different place in the coming elections? Whether changing within the same constituency or moving states, how sure are you? The other situation, you know your one of your relatives passed away. How sure are you that his or her name is struck out from the, from the electoral roll so that no one abuses the IC of the deceased and to be used in a coming election? To take us further on this discussion, I would like, I will be inviting my fellow student apprentice, Hugh Hung Liang, to give a presentation about this important topic. He will speak approximately 20 to 30 minutes. And before I lurch, I would like to give a brief introduction of him. You just bear with me. So meanwhile, please make sure that uh, your, your, your microphones are muted. And since the video is, uh, is being recorded, please ensure that, that your video is switched off also at the same time. So Liang is a law graduate from the Queen's University Belfast. While waiting for the results of his certificate in legal practice examination, he has chosen to be part of the apprenticeship program at Briffields Asia College, which focuses on the professional development of the apprentices. As part of the program, Liang has volunteered to contribute to Tindap Malaysia and participate in the electoral reform work. So Liang and fellow colleague uh, Hong Wei are with Tindap Malaysia for the student apprentice program from June all the way to late August. So without much further ado, I would like to pass the floor to Liang. And from there, he will present for the next 20 minutes, so hence to 3.25. So over to you, Liang. All right. uh, thanks, Danish, for the introduction. So as you mentioned just now, uh, this today's talk, it's about voters' registration and the essential stuff that you should know when you register as a voter. So the brief discussion of our points in this 20 minute session will be covering the standard rules of registrating and updating your details, uh, how to respond when a draft supplementary rule is being published and what you should do if there's an objection against you. So to briefly cover the first area, the standard rules for voters registration is usually when there is a new draft supplementary rule that's being released, the election commission will usually publish a notice in the Gazette to call upon all those who are qualified to vote and wants to register as a voter to check the draft supplementary rule. So those who are interested to register as a voter, they must fill in a copy of Form A that's found in the schedule of the election registration of electors regulation 2002, herein referred as the regulations. And every form that is being mentioned in this talk can all be found in the schedule of the regulations. So once you fill out Form A, you, the, the formal process is usually it needs to be personally handed towards the registrar of electors or assistant registrar of electors. But in reality, we, uh, it's highly understood that most NGOs such as Tindak Malaysia and other voluntary organizations also uh, helps out in the uh, registration process. But at the end of the day, a copy of the form needs to be personally handed to either the registrar or assistant registrar of electors. And the person who has registered as a voter, they will also have a copy of said form as well 
for record purposes. So in some cases, the assistant registration officer will also assist the voters registration process whereby the newly registered voter will receive a copy of Form A. So some extra pointers on the first area. So the notice of when a draft supplementary rule is being published will usually be in the form of a media statement either on the election commission's website or any of the state offices of the election commissions. Some news platform will also publicize um, when a notice of the draft supplementary rule is being published. So that's that. And now COVID-19 has hit, it's actually the election commission have already innovated the way they register voters. So last time it used to be you will go to the post office and register yourself as a voter, but due to pandemic times and the NCO period, the election commission has actually allowed newly registered voters to register online. And it's also important to take note of regulation 12 sub four of the regulations is that you're only allowed to register yourself as a voter or transfer your uh, registration details once during each quarter of the draft supplementary vote. So you're not allowed to register and transfer at the same time. So in, if you're already registered as a voter and you've changed your, uh, you've relocated during the, let's say the first quarter and the second quarter, you, you've relocated to a new area and you want to update your address, the way you do it is similar to how you register yourself as a voter it will be still via Form A as well. And if you relocated more than twice, you should follow the latest, uh, the, the latest address that you're currently residing in because that, the, that should be based on your most updated locality, which is important later on because it kind of determines where you'll be voting for in which polling district. Uh, Liang, sorry to interrupt. Are you sharing your slides? Yeah, yeah, I am. Okay, just wanted to <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Can you see? Okay. So in terms of when when the draft supplementary rule is being released, there are three things that you should look out for. So one is when the draft supplementary rule is being released, you should at least check for the accuracy of your details that you inputted in form A. So that includes your name. Sorry. Then I just wanted to make it uh, make sure can you guys see my screen? Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So from where I left off. So when the draft supplementary rule is being released, just check the accuracy of your details. That includes your name, your address, your NIC, and the date of birth is correct. You should also ensure that you're registered according to your designated polling district. And these details should be published in the supplementary rule as being revised. And also, if there are any objections against uh, the insertion of your name in the draft supplementary rule, form D will be sent to you. And the objector, who is the person that's making the objection, may object to the inclusion of your name in the supplementary rule. And lastly, uh, in terms of the locality or the address in the draft supplementary rule, it may not accurately reflect the address that you put in form A, but you should just make sure that the details that you registered in form A is almost similar to the loca locality of where you're staying. So lastly, what should you do if there's an objection against you? So the first thing is that when an objection happens, there will usually be a public inquiry which you are required to attend, but you also receive a notice in form E as to uh, why a public inquiry is being held. And Form E must also be served to you so that you are notified that a public inquiry is actually going on before you attend to the proceedings. So in terms of the burden of proof, usually the burden of proof lies on the objector. So they have to be uh, prepared to make sure that if they want to object towards your name, they must be ready with the evidence for your objection. And this is regardless of the fact whether you choose to attend the public inquiry as stated in Regulation 17 sub 5. And for any unreasonable objection, the objector will be punished with a fine up to 200 ringgit. So what happens if there is a mistake in your registration of uh, particulars? So when you're registering in Form A, uh, it turns out there was a mistake. So what can happen in this situation? So in terms of the, the registrar of electors, if the registrar managed to detect any mistake in your form, 
the registrar can make any um, can make inquiries to rectify the mistake, and they can also appoint a person to perform such functions as stated in Regulation 13 sub 2. So in terms of a voter, a notice may be sent to you by the registrar to, uh, to require you to give the correct details as to your qualification, your qualification as a registered voter. If you have applied to have your name registered in the supplementary rule and discover that your name is not there, you can submit a claim in Form B, which is basically a claim to the EC to insert your name in the supplementary rule. So yeah, just to take note about Regulation 14 sub 2 and 14 sub 4. So when you are submitting a claim, you should ensure that you have uh, the necessary information that's ready on your hand before you make a claim. Else it will be a baseless claim, which you then can be also uh, fined for making such frivolous claim. And lastly, for the objector, they can, like I mentioned before, they can object to the inclusion of your name in the supplementary role. They need to pay a fee for each person they object and they are only allowed to object once. For each objection, they are allowed to object up to 10 people. And you're also allowed to withdraw your objection not later than five days before the date fixed for a public inquiry. And a fine not exceeding 200 ringgit will be imposed on those who withdraw their objection after the five days period. So lastly, it's about the distinction of the powers of the registrar and the chief registrar. So the power of the registrar of electors is specifically provided for in a few, reg uh, reg a few regulations in the electoral regulations. So this includes uh, Regulation 13, which provides that the registrar must revise the supplementary role for the registration area they are appointed for every three months, which is four quarter in a year. And the supplementary role will contain names of newly registered voters and registered voters whose registration was transferred from a different registration area. This is clearly provided for in Regulation 11. So, but the power of the chief registrar is a little bit wider as they, are, they have the ability to exercise a list of general powers that's listed under Regulation 25. And if you read in Regulation 25, there is no time limit as to when the chief registrar can exercise such powers. And it's pretty broad as, broad as compared to the registrar of electors because their power is only limited towards, uh, yeah, in that specific uh, supplementary period. So with that, uh, that concludes my presentation. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Yang, for your short and brief and very important presentation. So let me go through the very first comment that came through. Okay, there has been six thousand seven hundred twenty-eight deaths just during this COVID pandemic. It's highly unlikely the family will notify the election commission. How can this be done automatically? Okay. So this the second uh, question, the uh, second point. This is a chimo comment. The objector find after five days if they withdraw the objection. This sounds odd. Need to clarify if it if it means less than five days from the date of hearing. So when for this Q and A, I will allow Liang to answer first. Uh, if not, myself, Falk, and my fellow colleague Hongwei will join in. So Liang, are you able to answer any of these two? Just give me a while. I, I'll look into the second question. But for the first question, I think I'll let you, I think you're better, you're in a better position to answer it. Okay. So what happens, especially when it comes to uh, death is because when a person passes away, you get actually like a certificate, a death certificate, okay? And this is what the, our National Registration Department also have it, okay? Every quarter, you know, the, if you notice in the draft supplementary role, they actually list out all, any of the individuals who have passed away, okay? And especially due to the COVID pandemic, one doesn't need to go to the post office, to the EC office to find the draft supplementary role. One just need to be alert, especially now, any time from now, to visit the SPR website, whereby they will actually show you the link to the particular uh, state EC office that you should visit. So for example, if you know someone has passed away in the state of Slango, you should also roughly know where which constituency or which part of the state he or she is residing. So you go to that and you will see the constituency and you just need to scan the QR code and then 
depending on the how EC does every quarter, you can actually find the name. Okay, so that's that's how uh, one way to look at it. Or if you know the IC, you take that IC, paste it in the pangundi.spr.gov.my during the draft supplementary role period, and the website should show showing that the pomotongan, the deletion is occurring. Okay, but if you know someone who is a voter who has passed away, let's say any time from April to June this year, and that detail did not go through to the EC website, please contact election commission immediately. Please do not delay any further. So this is my take on this because yes, the, the law says that the supplementary roles is about the additional voters and also the right uh, the new voters coming in and also those voters who updated the address. But if you really study the draft supplementary role, there are many types of voter movements occurring. New registrations, voters who are migrating and immigrate, uh, mig migrating out and migrating in from polling districts to dunes and the parliament, uh, voters who lost their citizenship right, voters who have passed away, this is deletions, uh, voters who got reclassified, some of them moved from being normal voters to police voter or, or military voters. Some of them actually went uh, from uh, used to serve in the military and police got discharged. They actually get parked in a particular locality. It's an aspatial locality, non-geographical locality called Bakas Tantra, Bakas Police. There are so many types of voter movements that you can see in the draft supplementary role. So your duty as a voter if you update your address, make sure your name is being updated by EC, point number one. If you know someone who has passed away, please make sure if it happens in the last three months that his or her name is in the process of deletion by EC. So I'm just telling you, please wait for the notification from EC. And in this case, disseminated via Malaysia Kini or any other major news portal via the media state. And that's the moment you should act. They have, you only have 14 days, so please do not delay. Yeah, for the question from P.I. Wong, uh, I think you're correct. It's actually less, uh, not less than five days from the date of the hearing. So if you withdraw your objection, let's say six days from the date of hearing, then that's considered as unreasonable. So yeah, you're, you're right in terms of that, that point of clarification. For the question uh, from Tanya, in, if you look at the uh, electoral regulations, the grounds for objecting, the, the grounds for objection is, is actually just basically to object the inclusion of the name of someone in the supplementary role. So that's one of the grounds. And I, from, from my understanding, it could be like a vast amount of circumstances. It could be, uh, let's say, the deceased situation where like, you know the person is dead, but why is his name still on the roll? So that could be one of the grounds to object. So yes, voters registration is a basic right. It's being uh, provided for an election act, but there are certain, it needs to be controlled. So it's not an absolute right, it's a basic right. So yeah, it's not absolute. Yeah, yeah, so that's that. This, this is my opinion. Okay, so we already went through the a set of three questions. Uh, I recommend questions to be typed out so that it is much easier for us to check back what is being conveyed. So I open the time for the next three questions. Yeah, just to address what Hong Wei said, yeah, the automatic re uh, voters registration hasn't been in place yet. Uh, it was just only, uh, there was just amendments that are not enforced yet. So the whole they needed to amend the uh, election regulation uh, to sort of cater for it. But as of now, uh, we haven't uh, catered towards that system yet. So when it comes and when the EC goes for it, uh, I, I think that they will slowly amend all of the regulations, not only the electoral, electoral regulations, the Election Offences Act, uh, your conduct of elections, they all need to be amended to cater for this new system. So yeah, when necessary, Okay, how, how about the others? Because I noticed some of us are from political parties. Uh, some of us are actually assistant registration officer. Now is the time to get your clarification. 
because some of us may encounter this type of questions around in the next few coming weeks. So now is the time for you to ask. Or meantime, uh, either my fellow colleague, uh, Uh, my fellow colleague Falk and Hongwei, if you have anything to add, please uh, please say so. Nothing to add at the moment, yeah. Okay. Nothing to add at the moment for me. I think I told Liam about the uh, automatic voter registration. Uh, and, uh, he already clarified that. Okay, so there is this question, okay, uh, from PY. I'm not sure. I understand the clarification. Uh, I understand the clarification. It would be better to show a chart with five days as the cutoff date. Is the fine imposed if the objective withdraws six days from the date or four days from the date? Uh, I think it's six days. So, yeah, I, I think it's six days. Because if you look at the uh, election regulation, it clearly, regulation 19, the way it's worded is. So an objector may withdraw his objection at any time not later than five days before the date fixed for public inquiry. So anything later than that, uh, it's a fine that will be imposed. And it's not fixed at 200 ringgit, it's up to the discretion of the uh, election commission. So it's on a case-to-case -case basis, so depending on how long. Uh, so the longer you withdraw, the more severe the penalty. I, that's, 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 that's from my experience because I... I don't have uh, actual practical experience on dealing with such objections, so I'm not really sure how the EC handles the case. You know, it's all really on the discretion. So yeah, I need to Yes, the it's yeah, yeah, it's a late penalty, and it's really it's all from right from day six onwards. Uh, a fine will be imposed, but as to the amount of the fine, it's completely at the discretion of the EC. Okay. Okay, so let's uh, uh, maybe uh, what we can do is we will read. Uh, Liam, are you able to read up that section? Oh, you mean share the screen? Uh, yeah. You can share the screen, but I think it's important for you to read it out so that everyone can clearly discern what it actually amounts to. I. Uh, wait, I think I'll just share the screen so it's easier so people can see. Okay. Okay, so the next question I received. Uh, if someone magically registered without ever really registered to vote, will this affect the real person to vote? Can the imposter go, go to the voting station first? Uh, this is a very important point. Okay. So, Liang, uh, maybe you can try first. The question is someone magically registered with this effect. The real person can the uh, I actually don't know how to answer the question. <laughs> yeah. So I um, think yeah. let, let's look at this situation. How does this might happen? Okay. You may let's say you're you are a person, a Malaysian citizen who yet to register at all. Okay. Yeah. So that's the first thing. So what has happened if someone managed to get your IC, right? And then this, uh, and this person registered yourself, right? Registered on your behalf. Okay. okay. So whereby uh, that person got the IC copy and also the IC, uh, the form itself. It's a Bora, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, but there is one problem with that. How are you going to get the signature of that person? Okay, so the question is, is this even possible, right? If it is, uh, let's say it's possible, okay, this is a bit interesting if that happens. They fill this particular form called Borang A, and then the form was, uh, was signed off, and this was submitted to EC, EC submit, okay. This is the time in the draft supplementary role you should actually look to object. Okay. I have not heard of that sort of situation before, but this is where you need to be on alert. Okay. Because if someone else register, 
uh, on your behalf, then sure, you know, the question is whether it's, are you going to be the imposter? Mm, not necessary, unless someone used your IC card, went to the polling stream, and the first polling clerk decides not to check your face. And they looked at the IC number only, called your name, and there was not a single sound of objection. So if you notice, there could be some, uh, uh, you know, there could be some problems uh, would be arising, but I can see this is not necessarily a very easy thing to do, someone to pull off this feet. But people like, you know, taking the chance, even of an existing registered voter and voting on their behalf, has it happened before? Yes, it happened in Tanjung PI by election, few of them. Anyone else would like to comment on this question? Well, uh, Danny, is just to comment, uh, because Form A requires the signature or the thumbprint, right? So yep. uh, the only way, uh, practical way to detect any fraud will be by way of the signature, yeah. If there's any discrepancy in the in the signature of the, the person who signed yep. Form A, yep. as a ground for objection, you know, I mean, from the practical point of view, yeah. How about the others? Uh, please do not. Um, may, may, may I ask? Okay, we, I will allow this time verbal questions. Uh, no, it's pertaining to just now the questions. I personally have experienced that there's Wuta, that when <clears throat> he was trying to register as a Wuta, but the system showed that he has been registered. And at the end, I mean, when, when, when uh, he's go to, I mean, they go and file a appeal and all this thing, then found that actually it's really indeed someone had registered on his behalf without his signature. So that does happen very often, I believe so. Okay. So if that happens, then that's where you're, that's, I mean, this is difficult. That is why, especially those who have not registered yourself as a voter, every three months, just, just get in your IC in the pengundi.spr.gov.my and just make sure that if you're registered, it's because you yourself agreed to it or you actually personally did it. If it is not, then please act immediately. Yep, and for that person, uh, he filed an appeal and complaints to EC later on. Okay, and can you elaborate a bit more about that experience, if you know? Sorry, Anis? Uh, uh, can you explain a bit more after what, do you know what happened after it was sent for appeal? Um, not yet. I mean, there's still no replies. He, oh, okay. he emailed. They asked him to email, but then there's no reply from EC after that. Oh. <clears throat> and then, uh, but I, I, I was heard that the, the ARO that was assisting in that registration was, was asked to I mean, it was questions by EC or something. I'm not sure what happened later on. Okay. So, so I mean, okay. having said that, I believe that any registration officer that assists in the water registration might also need to take very serious and carefully on, I mean, the form that they receive so that you will not be like, what happens to this person's then I mean, then you might bring yourself in trouble. Okay. Uh, let me look through the other questions. Okay. Now, Hongwei's question. Are there any remedies with the imposter voter situation? I remember that you, you can file a civil claim in tort. Are there any other venues? So this uh, section, I would like to ask Liang or Fok if you can comment on this matter.
Liang, do you need me to repeat the question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. I think you can definitely. I mean, there's a uh, there, there is a remedy to appeal, but the grounds to appeal under the electoral regulations, I think it's quite narrow. So obviously, of course, you can file a civil claim in court for misrepresentation or, or some sort of that cause of action. If uh, I think the, the, the ideal situation is you just appeal and file a claim in uh, the civil courts, because that way you got both options. Because if the appeal doesn't work out, at least you still got that civil claim, which is broader. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the sorry, just to comment, the civil claim is broader. Yeah, just yeah. in case the appeal doesn't go through, so it will be it will be it will be an option. Yeah, uh, to file a civil claim. Yeah. Okay, let me read this comment that just came up. In SPR trainings, preparing for elections on. On election day, if someone carries the IC and the IC number matches, they are allowed to vote regardless there is an objection. Such issues happen in far out polling centers, especially in Sabah and Sarawak. Yes, is that okay, this is the problem? Okay, so so this is where, uh, especially on polling day, please make sure the polling clerk check your face, because if they don't. This sort of things gets a much easier pass. How about the others? Uh, and just to comment, uh, Danish, before uh, this goes back to the issue of uh, the trading for uh, for Ketua Tempat Mengundi, uh, presiding officer and uh, polling uh, and Karani Pengundis, uh, the polling clerks. So uh, the EC would, would need to emphasize this, but I think they have some training videos now. So it is hoped that uh, the, the, the training I think, uh, the, the training needs to be uh, uh, improved, I think, in, in this regard, uh, responding to Suresh's uh, comment. Yeah. Yes. Okay, now I would like to open the next set of questions. We do have a lot of time, and especially those who didn't grasp any of the concepts please ask questions, especially now those some of us here who have joined are actually from political parties or represents uh, the, our elected representative's office. So please, uh, uh, please use this time to ask the questions. I, I also allow uh, verbal questions, or I also open the time for anyone who'd like to comment or clarify. How about those uh, who are serving as assistant registration officers? Do you have any questions or comments to clarify? Okay. How about fellow members from the NGOs who actually have AROs within themselves? So what happens is um, every quarter, while well, I wait for questions, every quarter when we come, uh, we will get to a notification from EC. Please visit their website. And especially now with all the COVID pandemic, you can do it everything from home. But of course, filing the forms like objections and everything is a bit different. I believe it's still, you have to still post it if I'm not mistaken, unless EC states otherwise. And 14 days do go very fast. Okay. Uh, Liang, do you have any other comments? Not really. <laughs> I think I'm, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Okay. But there is, a, there is a comment in the chat. So yeah. So let me read out the comment. Okay, sorry. Okay, first thing, it is a crime to pretend to be a certain voter when he is not. The victim can lodge a police report and press charges. Okay. My comments. EC usually will update the electoral roll to delete the deceased 
voters within three to six months. This is my observation. Uh, yes, so let's say his, his or her name who has passed away uh, did not got deleted, let's say in July. That person passed away in April to June. Then please make sure by October that the deletion is complete. Okay? Or the deletion is been is been made. Because if it is not, it is your responsibility to inform election commission without delay. Okay. So Mingson has this question. I might have missed some part of the class. My question, what is required to file an objection to a voter? Uh, yeah, yeah. I think I can take that. Uh, it's basically form D in the schedule. So form D will basically requires you to list out what, uh, so if you feel that you want to object the inclusion of a, name, a specific name in the supplementary rule, you just write that. And they also, uh, if you look at form D, there are also places where you can write the grounds for your objection. So you just write that and you just submit it. So that's pretty much how you object towards the inclusion. And now obviously the registrar will have to go through and check whether it's a proper objection. And then only then they will notify the person that's being objected to. And then they'll have to attend the public inquiry along with the objector, of course. So yeah. Okay. Now, um, then can I add on, on my questions? Yep. Sorry, Dennis. Yeah. Uh, then uh, when when they file the form D uh, and for the registration officer, uh, they would do, I mean, what type of verification are they doing? I mean, to, to ensure that it's actually a valid objection. So yeah, the power for, so for all of this is provided for, I think, regulation, uh, Regulation 15, yes. So it's basically to check. So if you want to object towards the inclusion of a specific name, right? And then later the, the registrar finds out it's like, oh, actually the name it, it's properly uh, it's properly registered on. So you don't really have a proper grounds to object the inclusion of such name. So they they also have to liaise with the objector. If they require any like further information, they'll have to ask from the objector uh, whatever further particulars they need. And then only if they are satisfied that the objection is satisfactory, then they will only move on. Because then they won't allow any, any kinds of, like, you know, if there's no control, right, then anyone can just object, then you'll be, uh, there'll be a lot of objections by the end of the day. So that's, yeah. Okay, oh, the reason I'm asking these questions, uh, during my recent voter registrations at uh, ETRA last month, no, sorry, on May, uh, it seems like, uh, uh, I, because uh, I on that day itself, I received. I mean, uh, when when uh, I received three questions from the publics that near come to the counter and they say that uh, they are they was uh, uh they I mean they I mean they they was told that uh that someone objects on their outer uh outer realization. I mean, uh, well, uh, sorry, uh, I'm trying to say that they say that the uh they moved they changed their address, but then after that they was actually objected by. The residents there, even when with a proper water and utility bill, I mean, but it's still that they was actually they object his water registration at that to to that address. I mean, how how would that happen actually? Sorry, that is you want to take it. Okay, so let me try to understand this uh, the situation here. What happens is uh, you have you uh, received a notification objection despite having all the evidence, um, but someone still proceeded, right? Am I correct to uh, interpret this statement? Yes, Dennis. Uh, to be to be specific, that person he stayed in Kalana Jaya and then he moved to Sedan. Yeah. And then uh, he he has actually updated the address to Sedan. Then later on, he received a notification saying that someone has objection of his change of address. So uh, he has bring the latest utility bills to that office that they mentioned, uh, but they still declined to, I mean, to update his information. So it still remain at Kalana Jaya after three years. Well, okay. So even though the evidence has been presented. Yes, correct. 
Okay, that that I think that's okay. This this, um, uh, because that's uh, because you have to. This happens during a public inquiry. Uh, let me see. Uh, Fork or Hongwei, could you please comment? I think this has to do with uh, uh, sub-regulation 17. Uh, but the other thing is also, did that person appeal? Oh, yes. So so that's why he, I mean, then uh, he has appealed a few times. Until that, I mean, on the day, then he still come here, then uh, when, when I bring him to the post office nearby, then they say, that, I mean, you can't do it. Again, you need to uh, push EC, I mean, on that changes. Because okay. I this... tried that, inside I tried there's one post office, so I bring him over. Then, I mean, but then uh, post office say that uh, we can't do anything, can changes here. And then because there's actually, uh, it seems to be issue, they uh, they decline uh, changes from post office anymore. Okay, so what, uh... Okay, let me just try to go through other points, okay? I'm not sure what happened later on because the ALO, I mean, the ALO that served the, with the registration the day, I mean, he take it further, but I, I'm not sure who is the person, I don't know him. So uh, I did not follow out later, but this is actually what I witnessed myself oh. that I received on the day. Okay, so, okay. So let me read out uh, some of the comments, maybe it might shed or, or not shed some light. Okay, I had some issues with voter complaining the address was different, but when asked, they register based upon current address, but the EC follows what's stated on the IC. Okay, that's correct. Because in my experience, if you apply via the post office, for example, you are supposed to show uh, the post office uh, staff will actually ask, is this based on your IC? Uh, more so, he or she will ask, is your IC address the most up to date? Okay, because we are following the IC in this instance. Okay, now they but they used used utilized uh, build address and as as far as I'm aware, the address is based on IC unless the IC address is changed based on the utilities bills address. I asked this question to EC. That was their response. Okay. The objection under regulation 17 has to be prima facie, so can't be any frivolous claim, but a solid foolproof uh, claim. Maybe, Hongwei, are you able to synthesize or make it in a simple layman's term, what it amounts to uh, verbally so that everyone can understand? Oh, okay, so um, in the public inquiry, um, when, the, when the registrar hears the objection, basically the only uh, you have the your objector has to have a very solid foolproof uh, um, evidence. So prima facie basically means um, that there is no way you can doubt that proof, uh, the proof of the object object uh, of the objection. So we, so uh, in response to uh, Mr. Uh, S. V. Zingham, uh, it it can't be a uh, it it can be a political move, but most likely in the case that. Uh, um, the evidence has been very, very, very strong, and there's no doubt that that the objection is uh, is valid to be able to to be able to um, to be able to um, uh, qualify as an objection, basically. Okay. okay let me see if there's any other comments or questions. So we still have fourteen more minutes. Uh, yes, can I uh, jump in? Yes. Sorry, uh, Danesh. Yeah. yeah. Now, the presenter was re referring to clause 19. Eh? Yeah. And uh, you have a cutoff date of five days before the hearing, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Now, normally, if you withdraw your hearing earlier than five days, that means six days, seven days, eight days, nine days, there's no fine. Oh, okay. Yeah. If you withdraw your, uh, your, your objection later than five days, that means D minus four, D minus three, that means they're not giving enough notice. So 
five days, four days, three days, two days, one days before the hearing. That means you're not giving enough notice of withdrawal of your objection. So that means you withdraw it too close towards the day of the Too late. Day. You have withdraw your, your, your objection too late. Yeah, yeah. Then you get a fine. Ah, okay. Because yeah. like you mentioned, the way they worded it, because uh, the... That's, that's why I suggested to you, yeah. you, you, make a, you make a diagram, then you won't misunderstand. Ah, uh, okay. Because uh, even you studying law, you can misinterpret it. That means it's easy for a layman also to misinterpret. Yeah, yeah. Is that Thanks, clear to you? Uh, yeah, yeah. Thanks for the clarification. Thanks, Pivai. Okay, next question. Okay, this is a very important question. How can we determine whether there are phantom voters on the electoral roll? If there, are, if there are any proof, what actions can be taken to remove them from the electoral list? Okay. Okay, one thing is, if you know that, but I just want to say, those who serve in political parties uh, will receive, uh, let me just, sorry, I just want to make sure I'm not muted, okay. Those who are serving as in the political parties officers, okay, you will actually get a CD from the election commission for every quarter. Your duty is someone in the party headquarters or someone you appoint, go to EC, fill up the form, get the CD. Okay. From that CD, look through and see if there are a sudden search of any voters in a given locality, in a given house, or a particular composition of voters that's moving in. Okay. So, for example, if you want to do this effectively, you cannot just look at one draft supplementary role. You need to look at least two or three in the past, and you should have the existing larger electoral role. So then you know, okay, this house started with one voter. Then later on, three voters joined in. Then later on, five joined in. But then you also notice there's no one leaving that house. Then what you do is you do a match and see whether they are related. If they are not related, then you should do, go on the ground and find what's going on. This, this is one way to look at it, okay? Because I just want, um, uh, what I understood from the CD, even currently they don't necessarily provide the full address, but correct me if I'm wrong, okay? But if your localities is very specific, then just having the house number plus localities is enough to pinpoint roughly where this person reside. Okay. Um, so that's, uh, anyone else would like to comment on that question? I'll repeat the question for everyone's interest. How can we determine whether there are phantom voters on the electoral roll? If there are any proofs, what actions can be taken to remove them from the electoral list? Don't, uh, no comment. I think you, you addressed it perfectly. <laughs> Yeah, so it actually depends on how, uh, so that's a comment. Yes, with the locality, it's quite easy to narrow down the address. Yes, subject to which constituency? Uh, if it is like quite urbanized areas, like where we, like in Subanjaya, Pataling Jaya, or let's say other major cities in Malaysia, localities can be very street specific or flat block specific, then it's quite easy to find. But where the challenge would arise if you try to identify any suspicious voter movements in, a very generic locality like Kampo. It's a bit difficult to point out. Okay. Uh, any other points? We still got 10 minutes because I want to make sure that all of us are very clear in uh, on this topic so that if anyone were to ask you, you know what to do. Yeah, Hello. Can I can I give a, can I give a, 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 an answer to the question when you have an instance where you have a shop house which has been uh, put as the address of the voters? You can yeah. have many people. I'm Rosita. Hello. Yeah. Uh, that's an instance uh, which happened in Slango. You know, it's a shop house because uh, the lot, the the shop house has a lot number especially with lot number. Yeah? So when you have lot numbers, so you have so many registered voters under that name, maybe hundreds. That's the case in Selangor. Because in my one area I live, 
uh, I have to use the shop house uh, lot number. Uh, and then uh, they find out that there are hundreds of, of voters under that shop house name. It is not changed. There's no way they can change because all the houses under that area has no number. So that is the instance where you can have so many voters under one address. This is not usually housing area. It is a uh, kampong, a village. And in this case, it was Kampung Dato Abu Bakar Banginda, which is just next to Pressing 14. Yeah, hmm. it's in Kepang. Yeah, okay. Okay. Okay, so... Anyone else who yet to comment the question? Uh, Rosita, you can lower your hand, by the way, because you already did your comment. Okay. Anyone else? Or anyone else would like to share their experience of handling voter registration problems? Uh, we got around seven more minutes uh, before we conclude our meeting. The time is yours to ask any questions. Okay, so if I don't see any questions, uh, Fork, uh, you can stop the recording. Yeah, I can. Uh, all right, I'll stop the recording. Yeah. You stop the recording.